good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome to another session of Forward Focus Thursday, the emphasis upon forward. And we're thankful today that you're with us and um, we hope to have a very lively discussion. And today um, I ask that you share this and give some likes. I'll be watching the post as well as Reverend Sandra Pace who helps us out. And I wish to thank Brother Alan Lavender, who helps, who, who takes care of the technical side as well as Sister Frey. And the brainchild of our brother and the pastor of Allen Temple AME Church, uh, the Reverend Dr. Joseph Nathaniel Cousin Sr. So today's discussion, we're going to talk about January 6th, the insurrection, or as some would call it, on, depending upon how you view it, the big steal, the lie that's surrounding the events of this day and how it will affect us moving forward. But as we do, we wish to take this opportunity to welcome our panelists, the persons who keep the discussion lively. We try to keep it within an hour. And so bear with me. And we're gonna start from the youngest on up to the wisest. Started out with the pastor of Bethel New Haven, uh, Reverend Stephen Cousin Senior. How you doing, Steve? I'm here get in there. You know, I, I think I can see light at the end of the tunnel. So, you know, once I get some more news, I, I, I feel really good about light. But so I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about what's next to come for me. All right. That's the amen. Uh, Dr. Joe. Hey, Mike. I'm good. Just hey, everybody. Uh, glad you could join us today. Just glad to be with you. And yep. um, just enjoying life. All right, uh, Phil. Yes, uh, good morning to all the panelists and to everyone uh, watching. I say morning because on the West Coast, it's just a little after 9 a.m. Uh, I'm happy to be here and happy to be in the, in the new year. But I am, uh, if my nephew is cautiously optimistic, I am hopefully pragmatic. And so I have switched my background to unclear because that is how I see the present and the future moving forward immediately, unclear. All right, and Daddy, how are you feeling today? I'm trying, I'm trying to feel good, Michael. I'm, I'm saying a, a verse to me every day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let me rejoice and be glad in it so I can get away from the groundhog aspect that has somehow engulfed me over the last two years. So I say to myself every morning, now this is the day that the Lord has made. Let me rejoice and be glad in this day and forget about all those other days that somehow they just seem like they just mash all in together. So I'm feeling, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the pause button. You know how you push your pause button away? I push the pause button in, in, in my life. Now I'm, I'm paused, I'm waiting, hopefully looking forward and not wanting to go backward. So this is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and try to be glad today. Amen. And I see we are joined by the pastor of Trinity AME Church in Kansas City, Kansas, Reverend Stephen Anthony Cousin Sr. Steve, how are you doing this on this day? I'm doing, doing okay. If, if, if Joe hadn't called me, I would have slipped on into another day. It's, it's cold outside. We had a little snow. Not a lot. Thank you, Jesus. So, uh, But if everything is fine. Amen. Amen. Glad to be here. Well, brothers, and that, let's 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 in the words of Chris Cuomo, let's get after it. Here it is, um, the big steal insurrection day that we see that we witnessed last year. Give some background upon it in terms of the hearings that are being conducted to learn and investigate the players and those who were the planners behind the scenes. We 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 realize that this is the result of a two party system where it seems like one party is unable to accept the results of a fair, uh, fair and conducted election. You have the Democrats today who will focus upon this day in terms of how it affected the Republic. And you have the Republicans who will deflect uh, from it and will talk about it was a terrible thing, but then will look at it as a way the other parties using it to politicize and, and to further their agenda. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the leader of the minority party in the Senate uh, just briefly touched upon it, but then he threw off 
on the fact that if the former president was the nominee of the party, he would support him. Um, you know, today, the, the current president, President Biden, spoke about it. He said, this is the result when people fail to accept loss. There was a song to hear back in the 70s, the controllers. Somebody's got to win. Somebody's got to lose. <laughs> so, you know, so, it, you know, it, it, that, that's, that's how it is. You, you celebrate winning, but then you have to learn from how to lose. How to lose. And so I yes. think that we as a country... We have failed to learn how to accept when things may not go our way. And the greatest thing here, when they showed the riot going on, um, they have the Confederate flag raised in the rotunda. Was significant in the fact that the flag never made it close to the building during the Civil War. But here it is in a, a symbol of rebellion, of hatred, was raised in the return. It tells us uh, we have a lot of work to do. And for those who are watching today, feel free. I'm looking at the comments as well as Reverend Pace. And we would try to get, if you have a question, I hit upon it as the discussion goes along. I've done my part. Uh, let's go around our views about today. How do you see this day in terms of uh, from your perspective, uh, who would I just throwing it out there? Uh, I, I'll start first off. I, I just want to make sure that we always do like an us versus them mentality and like Democrats versus Republicans. But I will shout out it wasn't all Republicans um, that felt that way, where Liz Cheney was especially a vocal person among the Republican Party, although you know she did lose her leadership role. Mm -hmm. um due to her making the stance so it was it was very majority of republicans but it wasn't all the republicans who felt that way i, I want to start by saying that um i will say that this has always been building up in our culture where you can see the lines being clearly defined and clearly drawn especially when you live in the 24-hour news cycle age where you got one half of the country watching Fox News and you have the other half watching CNN or MSNBC. And they're both saying that whoever's watching the other network, they're lying, fake news, what have you. And so, and also by being on Facebook, where now you live in a world where you do have like-minded people and you, I don't believe that you are in the minority of opinion where now you actually see people out there who may express or share the same views as you, where you may thought you were the only one thinking about it, but now allowing social media, you're allowed to hook up with other like-minded people to actually coordinate this. So let's, like, let's not actually really call it for what it is. We are so divided. We're still very um, divisive in terms of where we are as a society where we don't believe that one side has lost over the other. And that's really what the culmination of January 6th. When you have an election where a person who lost the election with 73 million votes, and then you had the majority on President Biden, I think he won with like 77 million. No, it, he, won with eight, he won with 84 million. When it, was, when it was all said and done. Yeah. 84 million, but 73 million votes should not be discredited. That was the most that a president, um, presidential candidate ever received in the history of our nation, 73 million for a losing candidate. It just goes to show you where we are as a nation. And when you have that person with that type of background, with that type of influence, with especially having a media presence, that's what you got on January 6th, was supposed to be a routine day, come in and certify the results. But you have those who truly believe that the election was rigged, it was fake, and that's always, we always talked about the election um, in terms of the validity of it. We always talk about the electoral college. So to me, this is nothing new where we are. We're so divided in our nation, in our ideology, in our politics, that of course this is going to happen. This is really a house of cards. It's never been a democracy. Um, it's, it's never been that. 
And I think we need to really understand and really know what type of government we have. But see, Steve, the, it's, it's not the 70 plus million votes for the loser that bothers me. It's how you handle the loss. And, and the difficulty is you don't stoke the fire and take the loss that way. Because if that's the case, anytime anybody loses something, they could they could um, handle it like that. So great. You got 70. Uh, if you got 70 million votes and your opponent got 70 million one votes, guess what? You lost. Take the loss and don't sit there and stoke the fire and shout out to the current president today because that speech he made today. Um, I'm all right with that because you got people walking around with Let's Go Brandon shirts on. Do y'all know what Let's Go Brandon means? Yes. Yes. You got people openly wearing shirts that say um, blank Joe Biden, which is ridiculous. So you know what? God bless you. If you lose, you lose. Take the loss. Go home. Sit down. Think about what you did wrong. Let me, right. let me, let me, let me come in and say this. As, as one who has, who has lived for 88 years, it has always been the hardcore, negative, racist society that has tried to rule whatever happened. And now with the influx and the change in the demographics within the framework of our nation, where more brown and black folk are coming in, those who have been like uh, in control, who have white privilege, white preference, white dominance, they are scared. Let me give you a little, little history. When I grew up, there was no Republican Party in the South. The Republican Party was considered to be, considered to be at, at that time, the party of Lincoln. After Strom Thurmond and after a few of the others, George Wallace, and the Democratic Party was always the hardcore, rock bottom, racist party in the South. But when someone got in that party, they thought got too liberal, they formed the Dixocrat Party, then they formed the Republican Party, and all those who wanted to exercise whatever racist aspects that they had were flew and flowed into the Republican Party in the South. And that's what made it so strong. I have I have nothing to say about those. What we what we have is people who want to make our nation become an autocratic nation with one who will allow how you look to prevail over who you are. And that is that is not at all wise. If you look at the at the flip flops that the so-called good Republicans have done, start with the minority leader in the Senate, with the minority leader in the House. Even old Lindsey Graham in South Carolina and others have said how this was mistakenly bad and all this. Then after the voice of the autocratic leader in mar lago spoke up, they all shifted and changed. How you have someone from North Carolina saying that, oh, it was nothing but a tourist expedition. Could you see him there? They stayed and Senator Ross from Wisconsin, or Johnson, Ron Johnson, Wisconsin said they, they kept within the framework lines in Rotunda which was a big lie. The problem is how can you have a nation that allows lies so obviously, lies. so obviously there to be controlled by those when you take a look at what's happening, the, the Senate is controlled by persons who represent only about 25% of the nation. Now that's because of, of the way we are. You look at what's happening with the filibuster, and if you aren't careful, we're going, we aren't going to have any voting rights law. I've lived through three sessions of this. No, I, I, am, I, am, not, I am not tolerant of them. All of them, they need, they need to, to take a look. One, one, one man, one commentator, I think his name was Stevens, who was the manager for Romney when he ran, said, uh, said Pence, needs to be listed as the biggest hypocrite in the world. So he's up there moralizing, talking about how he's against adultery and against abortion and all this. Then who does he hook up with and hang with and run with but 
one who is the epitome of all that he said he disliked, said Pence is the biggest hypocrite in the whole nation and ought to be penned as so. Now, we, I have lived to see that. I have lived to see how we have allowed, and, and the danger with, with our community is, you know, there, John O'Killens wrote, wrote a little couplet. Too much love, too much love. Nothing kills a black man like too much love. And, and the black folk, we, we, we've learned to love. Is love the answer? Or will we, will, will we at some time understand that, that maybe, uh, maybe I need to do like Stephen. I'll push the pause button and go into mute because that really stirs me up. I've, I've, been, I've been through all of this. Don't tell me about no white folk who, who are so good and liberal. No, it had two Republicans out of over our 200 who spoke up. You talking about good Republicans? Show me some. I'm going mute now. Oh, oh have yeah, mercy. Well, well, let me, well, well, let me just, <laughs> well, let me just, let me just say this. We live in a culture of lies. We heard it said some time ago with the introduction of alternative facts. And the former president uh, set the stage for distrust when he said the only way that he could lose the election is if they cheated. Mm -hmm. And then he proceeded to fool with the mail system, to slow the mail down, because the majority of, of, of the Democrats uh, sent their stuff in. A whole lot of them did. So, you know, mailed in their ballots. And so he wanted to challenge that. But it has just been one lie after the next. And what I've discovered is people are, are more apt to believe a lie than the truth. And so it's just, it's just a culture of lies. Just lying, lying, lying. He's probably somewhere lying right now, you know, which is, which is terrible. And that is that has taken hold all across the land and even in the church, as if it ever left the church. <laughs> you got some of the biggest liars on earth in the church. Yes, in the church. That's why we have the condition that they, that's why we're in the condition we are now in the church, because of lies. If people would just tell the truth, we'd have a much better place in which to live. Isn't that right? All right. I wish I knew the truth. I wish somebody would tell me the truth. Let, let me try to tell you the truth. The, the, the truth is, we live in a country now where there is no truth. Truth is perspectival. We have put opinion on the same level as fact. Mm -hmm. and, and that is why we have the division that we have. The truth is, as Daddy was saying, this country hasn't changed. This country has not changed, not one jot nor tittle since the Civil War. Um, when Daddy brought us to Durham, North Carolina, his life was threatened by the Ku Klux Klan on the regular. Mm -hmm. That was in the middle 60s. Yes. When I went to pastor in the same place that he passed it, and the year was 1992, it barely turned to 1993 before my life was threatened by the same Ku Klux Klan because they could not stand the prospect of seeing the advancement of people of color in any capacity. That's what is driving the country right now. It is white fear because in the next generation, the country is going to be uh, brown. It is not going to be white. And that's that, right. that fear is driving white folks. And so we have, we have before us the, the same kinds of, of forces uh, coalescing that were at the heart of the Civil War. The Civil War was, the, was front and center about the issue of enslavement of people of African ancestry. But the underlying current that never went away was the issue of states' rights. That is what the Civil War was about. Yes. And what we have now is a country divided along opinions with regard to states' rights. And so the, the, the major issue before us is, as a country, are we united behind the law of the land? 
or does every individual state get to interpret the law and rewrite and make its own law as it sees fit? That is why we have all of these states that are gerrymandering the, the voting process, trying to disenfranchise people of color and, and, and doing so uh, in the face of a Congress that because you got some uh, white folk who claim to be good, but who are not, will not vote to reinforce. They will not vote to reinforce voting rights legislation. So all, all January 6th did was expose what has already been there. Mm -hmm. And that's the ugly petticoat of America, which is racism. Now, as we go on with this discussion, again, I tell persons uh, who are watching, feel free, I'm looking at the comments. We have those that uh, are watching now. Thank you so much. Uh, just to take us back, we knew that this was an event that was going to take place. Uh, let's, let's, let's step back to 2019 for the State of the Union address by President Trump, the speech he gave, and the silent protest that was there. But at the end, there was something monumental that occurred that had never really occurred publicly. Uh, on national TV, that when he finished, that the copy of the speech that he, that he had spoken from was publicly torn up by the Speaker of the House um, in full view of uh, the viewing audience. Uh, some cheered, some jeered. Uh, so it gives us, there were some indicators that this is coming to a head. Uh, moving forward, we, 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 how is this going to affect the landscape? This is 2022 and they're already gearing up for the midterm elections, which we, we know historically that we as a people really don't participate in due to the fact of misinformation of saying that we were not allowed to vote in the midterms, but only in the general election. Uh, I'm yes. just throwing it out there. I, I can't, I mean, I know we, we danced around it a little bit, but Really, we never talked about self-preservation. Really what all aspects of life simply is, what's gonna be in it for me? And how am I going to you know, benefit from it? And what do I have to do to survive? And that's really all what you see. You, you see one side who may be dying out um, as the norm in society is self-preservation. We do that in the church where we have groups within the church that are protecting one another, that are covering mm. up for one another. Mm. As all the wrong as they have done, they're basically trying to protect themselves and actually trying to cover up certain things that they may have done. What we've seen right now, there's no accountability. There's nobody being held responsible. And you're seeing that in January 6th, you're seeing that in our church, where here we are, we're huddled up, we're just protecting ourselves because it's all about self-preservation. And my thing is, for what people are thinking, what's the point of doing something if it's not gonna benefit me? A lot of people out there who talk about voting, what's in it for them? Why should I wait in line for eight hours? How is it gonna benefit me? How is it gonna impact me? It's not about what the country is. Look, we can't even get people to get vaccinated. Because once again, they're thinking about themselves. Uh, it, it's a personal issue. It's my personal belief. But you're not thinking about the other. And so when, when you have that type of mindset where it's all about self-preservation, it's all about your own particular motives and ideals, this is what you're going to have. I'm just so tired of people saying that it's all about the community, it's all about the village. No, let's be real, it's all about you. You got certain groups that protect each other, they try to cover up for one another because they're trying to preserve what they have. And that's all what you see. So until we actually get out the mindset of, hey, sometimes we need to sacrifice for others, and sometimes we need to call things out for what it is, we're always gonna be having this conversation. We're always gonna be dancing around the bush because we always wanna make sure that we actually protect ourselves and we don't wanna do anything unless it's gonna directly benefit us. All right. Son, that's, son, that's good, but, but self-preservation is the first law of nature. 
So it's within a person's nature to want to take care of yourself. You know, I, I wish we could get beyond that. I wish we could. But if I was in the ocean and there was one life preserver and, and, and another person was in the ocean with me, I'm going to do all I can to get that life preserver. And, and just the, the other person can just go on. But that's just how we are. And even in the church, it's all about, it, it's all about self-preservation. What's in it for me? What so, can I get out of it? I'm how, going, can it how can it feather my nest? I'm going to throw a little hot sauce on the discussion right now. Has this sort of thinking uh, affected us as a denomination in terms of sort of like a state's rights or per se, and the oh, absolutely, right. absolutely, uh, Dr. Uh, Cousin, the, absolutely. The, 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 entire, the entire culture has become an every man for himself and Jesus for us all kind of a, of a culture. And so we don't care about each other anymore. But what we need to be doing right now is galvanizing through our churches, the masses and encouraging them finding ways to compel them to get to the polls by any means necessary. Because if we do not, if we lose the midterms, the, the, the stage is set oh, for yeah. the return of an idiot who had people believing the vaccine was bad while he took it, but they could inject themselves with Clorox and expose themselves to light and rid themselves of the virus. Uh, creating a fomenting a culture where people say, I don't trust the vaccine, but I don't mind taking this horse medicine over here. It's madness and it is insanity, but it Amen. plays upon the fears. It plays upon the stupidity, the stupidity of, of the masses. I mean, you know, the, 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 these are people who choose to believe a lie when the truth is right there before them. And, 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 and even now, it's sad to see CNN go through these uh, Trump supporters asking them about the election, and they still believe that, that Trump won because he said he won, when the truth is clear, he lost. But, but it, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's the same kind of stage that was set. Yeah. I took myself off the screen by, by, by accident. It's the same stage that was set when, when Hitler took over in Germany in the 30s. Very same. Go ahead, Daddy. You, you were shaking your head like you wanted to jump in there and I follow up with Joe. Go ahead, Daddy. You know, that, that is, is, is so, so very true. Uh, the, the question that you raised about what, what influences it have on our church. Uh, states' rights can be uh, equated to Episcopal district rights. What, 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 what you do in, in your state governs what you do. What you do in your Episcopal district governs what you do. Has no regard for what the national law says or what the there government says, what the governmental law says, but mm -hmm. now we, we we equate states' rights and Episcopal district rights almost in the same way. You do what you want, and how you say we come to we come to a a connectional meeting. We talk about laws, then we go back home and we do everything to undergird those laws with with our own wishes and our own wills. That's what states' rights does. Sometimes many can see this happening within the framework of within of our institution. And the danger is when things like this prevail in our nation, and when it prevails, this is a this is a mood and a mode that's taking place internationally. And when it does this internationally, sometimes it flows over into those institutions which are not governmental, but which are sometimes ecclesial and sometimes are social, but they, it flows over in the same way we're beginning to think about how autocratic they become and how they allow themselves to govern what they are and who they are by virtue of what they say and what they want 
regardless of what they say they are and what they say they're going to do. And that makes it to the point where laws mean sometimes nothing in many instances, and it flows over into every aspect of our society. That's the danger when, when you have something like January the 6th happening in our nation. It not only affects the nation, it flows over into every part of our nation. To become an autocrat, to become ruled by those who can govern what they want, who make the rules as they go along, who change the rules as they go along. And I think that one, one, if, if you look at our nation and see how McConnell from Kentucky changes the rules like however they want to change them, on, in fact, who it is. And that, that affects in personalities, it affects instances, and it flows over in, if you aren't careful, we don't have the guardrails up high enough to keep that from flowing over into the institutions, which are not a part of the governmental structure, but which are a part of society and a part of the cultural life that governs us. And when that flows over into it, we have the danger of the same thing happening in places where we are a part that has taken place in the nation's capital and it flows over into the state's capital and it flows over into institutions which are affected by what they see happening in the state and in the nation. Joe? No, just echoing what dad said, you know, it's, it's, um, it's bad and, and, and about the church, the part that still saddens me is how some people can call themselves believers, especially those that, that tend to lean more towards the evangelical ilk can call themselves believers and still buy into all this nonsense and, and even say that, you know, that they were inspired by Jesus to go to the Capitol and do what they did. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. So it just, but just, it's just, it's, it's bad. So you really have to be careful as to and understand your theology and understand your Christology and understand your core beliefs because anybody that's going to attack um, an institution like that, people like that, things like that, does not believe in the same God nor subscribe to the same Jesus or, or Christology that I do. So now you're looking at the expression on my face. I just want to ask this next one, adding a little more hot sauce. Do you see a January 6th event in the future in terms of the present situation of the church? Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, mean, when you when you think about the, the go, go ahead, son, go ahead. No, no, you honestly, to, to what extent is the, is the question, you know, to, to what well, extent? It, go? Here's, with COVID, here's what I mean, it, with virtual, with churches, what we see now uh, with COVID, with 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 churches being unable, some are closing, some, are, some I mean, it seems as if there's, def, there's a deafening uh, cry for some type of relief uh, just to just to have a dialogue, a conversation. Uh, go ahead, Stephen. You, you can go back to the actually, brotherhood movement. Go, go ahead, son. Go ahead, son. I was going to say, we don't actually get this current crisis under control that we face in our church. There's going to be where there will be no more respect or nobody will respect the authority uh, of, of, a, of a bishop. Where the very foundation, the very structure that we have in place, where if we can't trust the, the system, our whole system is based off of appointments. One, the pastor accepting the reappointment and the congregation accepting that appointment. Given that our institution is based on trust, given that with this particular crisis we are now faced with, who is going to listen to a bishop and say, go there, and what happens if the pastor says no and the congregation says no? Then what's going to happen? Because uh -oh. right now, we don't... Go ahead, Right son. now, in terms of trust, in terms of there's nobody stepping up to the plate who's resolving this crisis. Livelihoods are on the line here. And for yet, for persons not to really take it seriously, or really understand the, 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 the gravity of the situation, who is going to respect the authority of the bishops moving forward? But what you have, but let, me, let, me, let me say something because uh, I, as, as far as a chain of command kind of goes, 
uh, Danny has certainly distributed more appointments than all of us combined have ever received. But I have received more appointments at the hand of a bishop than anybody else on this panel. What makes the system work is exactly what Stephen Jr. is saying, and that is the trust that we have in our Episcopal leadership. When that trust is eroded, then we are going to face at the level of the clergy, the same kind of crisis that we're going to face at the level of the laity, and that is the erosion of consumer confidence. What happens when you no longer believe in the product, in the vehicle, in the process? And, and that is what we have to, that is what we have to deal with. What, what, what is happening in our church, and, and it parallels what is happening in the country, is the, the entire governing process has been undermined and is called into question. Uh, with, with, with the federal government uh, exceeding, not conceding, but exceeding to states and their desire to do what they want to do. And then in the church, with the episcopacy exceeding to uh, what bishops want to do in their individual episcopal districts, what we do is we devolve. We are no longer a church governed by a council of bishops. We become a church governed by a cabal of conspirators because they actively work and campaign to cover up the misdeeds and misdoings of each other. And that is what will ultimately undermine the, the, the basis, uh, not so much of the church, but of the denomination and Maybe all the it, processes that make us a denomination. But this is, this, this is not the first one. time. Wait, wait, let me wait, say this, Steve, Michael. Wait a minute, Steve, let dad. Da uh, daddy uh, can answer this. Daddy Dad's can answer this, Michael. Daddy's the one that can respond to this. Go ahead, No, but dad. Daddy, can, daddy can answer this. Go ahead, Dad. This is not the first time the church has been in crisis. Right. Prior to 1956, there was no general budget. A bishop got whatever a bishop got, and it became extraneous. Then they came up with the general budget. They thought that would solve the problem. So this is not this is not the first time. Go 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 ahead, Dad. No, it's not the first. It 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 started. Nineteen fifty six was 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 a pivotal point in 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 our in our in our church. Nineteen fifty six was when we began to take a look at our church hopefully trying to bring, put some guardrails up as to how money was raised, how it was used, how it was expended. And in the 1956 General Conference in Miami, one of the things I remember, that's the year I finished seminary and mm -hmm. I was there. And one of the things I remember is they had this big parade uh, uh, in, inside and had people had placards as a big trash can down the front. And on it was said, no more this day, no more endowment day, no more this day, no more that day, no more this day. They were dumping it all in the trash can and they were coming up with a connectional budget, which, but, but, the, but the problem became very difficult because we were then collecting money for, for membership. We had the, the conference claims and the membership claims. And, you were then paying based upon conference claims and the amount of members you had. You, you, you were paid so much for members, a dollar per member, and people could pay that. So then they came up with, with, with the idea in that legislation, every church now would have to pay a connectional assessment of $4 for or from every member that you claim. So now you have people who claim 2000 3,000 members, they weren't going to pay no twelve or $14,000. So what happened? They adjusted the budget tariff scale and said, okay, we'll give you a 19% decrease in what you say you had. So you did reduce that by 19%. Out of that same general conference came what we now, what, what was then the minimum salary department. The minimum salary department 
was there so that preachers were to get, based upon their classifications, a certain amount of money from the connectional church to, as to supplement them because we want to maintain good clergy. And so good clergy would receive that. Minimum salary then, then changed and uh, it later became, became what we now have as Retirement Services Incorporated. But it started out as a Ooh. minimum salary department. We, the Brotherhood, as Stephen has mentioned, the Brotherhood was very strong. There has always been, always been in the AME church an under, undercurrent of, of the kind of, of rebuttal of, of some of the things that happened. But you, you take a look at the history of the church as, from my standpoint, it's always been a, a tit for tat, a tit for tat. You, you, ha you had one where, where, where you, got, and, and you, got, you got the bishops out in, in way back in the 30s, then you came back in the 40s, you got more bishops out, and then the bishops got back on the preacher and said, okay, you can no, no longer stay in your church for eight years, then you come back and you got something else. So it's always a backward or a forward. And in the midst of it, the laity came up and said they want some, some argument uh, or some place in the argument and something to do. And the, and the lay organization started with this, with this heaviness in the fourth Episcopal district. But we, we have been always a church that, that has listened sometimes to the revolutionaries. The revolutionaries have, have brought about a number of things that have happened. But what, what is, when, when you, the law is only as good as it is applied and carried out by persons who respect it. You can have all kinds of outstanding laws, but if the persons who are to apply Amen. and make sure that it's there, if they don't respect it, then the law is nothing but words on a piece of paper. So, so yeah, yes. I, have, I, have a, I have a point here that I saw that it seems like uh, to give a good illustration within the church, it, we almost have a mindset of management versus labor sort of thing going on. Uh, with the current in terms of the current state and and that's what it is right dad it's, it's always isn't it always that just like any other corporation a management versus a labor issue it, it 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 gets to be you see don't don't uh forget that the the keys the keys for the ame church are two things election and assignment whatever happens in management and labor are dependent upon election and assignment. So dad, with, 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 that, with that in mind, dad, then both of those things hinge on the episcopacy. Oh yeah, it, it, that's election. And, and assignment. And, and, and assignment. But, but it also has to do with the laity as well. Because <clears throat> the laity, the, every, every part of the Hammy church from missionaries to laity to YPD to Sons of Allen to any, everything, all you have a meeting with the election and you have a good big crowd because all everybody wants to know who's going to be elected, who is going to be the one that is responsible for the administration of whatever laws and rules there are which govern us in our specific part of the institution in which we are presiding. You know, one of these days, what we're going to, have to do is, we're going to have to pursue uh, Daddy's idea that what we actually have are three separate and distinct AME churches, mm -hmm. okay. with the lay having their church, the WMS and YPD having theirs, and then the general church having its, as uh, demonstrated by the fact that we've got three separate and distinct meetings where they come up with three separate and distinct bodies of law. And then it is incumbent upon the general church to try and incorporate whatever changes occur in law as it pertains to the organization and the WMS and YPD. Can we, can, can we talk about the, can we talk about the WMS just for a minute? I'm really going to ruffle some feathers now. Oh, here we go. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we, we're on it now. When we 
elected the first female bishop. We uh, gained uh, male supervisors, which is just about as crazy as me taking off all my clothes and running outside in 20 degree weather right outside my house. Crazy. I mean, the logical thing would have been to go from the Women's Missionary Society to the Missionary Society and right. call it call it what it is. But now we have men who are supervisors of the Women's Missionary Society, which makes about as much See, we see, see, we're not making sense. Well, St Steve, what, what I've always advocated is, I think I told Dad this some years ago. The the moment you did that, the moment we elected male uh, female bishops and had male supervisors, the name should have probably been changed to the UMS, the United Missionary Society, and change it from the WMS, from the Women's Missionary Society. Just just missionary society. Well, just just call it right, right. Because we had we had we had the parents might. Uh, what was that, Dad? The parents might missionary society. Yep, yep. The grandma was in that. I mean, yeah, the, the, missionary, the, first? the missionary society, it it merged in the forties from the from the uh, women's home missionary society and overseas society, and the first president was elected Ann Heath from Tampa, Florida. She was elected the first president. But now you 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 have to understand when you when you talk about 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 the, the missionaries and and what it does. In 1968, there was a discussion in the general board when the question about making the missionary society become almost a united missionary society. And the then president of the society said, what are the ladies going to have? You need to give something just for the ladies. You don't need to mix it up like that. So they agreed to let it stay just for the female. And, and in actuality, males at that time could not be members of the Women's Missionary Society. They could not be. But then they let them become some kind of membership. They, 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 that's where we start stretching the law and, and making the law. And, and as a matter of fact, when you talk about the missionary, no person who is an itinerant elder can be a member of the Missionary Society. Well, we don't do oh, that. That's, well, that's, that's something. That's not that's that's the window. But, you, but, but look at. But, but, but look that, that's the law. That's the law. You and, and if, if if you you talk about the three churches, why do the Women's Missionary Society and the lay organization bring their laws to the General Conference to be then approved and adopted and put in the discipline? Right. If they if they aren't if they aren't separate entities. They are they are they are operational entities within the framework of what what we want to call a big tent kind of institution, where mm -hmm. if not only and there's one other and I, I have to say it gently, but we we also will have another one uh, that uh, the women in ministry. It's going to be if we aren't careful. <laughs> if, if, uh, if we, aren't, we aren't careful, but but that that's and. and the, the, the reason for that, women started late being ordained and right. some, some, some of the, very late, some of the, some of the appointments that men would not take, women took. And when they started taking, they, they, they began to, be, the acceptance level rose and the men started getting froze out. And then, see, most of the women came in as second and third professions. Not, not, not initially out of college or somewhere, because they had been frozen out so long. But men now, and and you take a look at, at what's happening in our church. If we are careful, we're That's going, right. to, we're going to become a bivocational institution for clergy. Because if if we don't raise our standard of of sustaining support for persons who come into the ministry. And expect full time ministry, you cannot. And I've heard Philip say it, and uh, they're not going to do. When I came into the ministry, I came in full time supposedly, and I received a great big salary of $16 a week. 
And I was married, had a child, no, no parsonage, no place to live, and hopefully trying to find a place to sustain myself. But I'm not, I'm not complaining or not, not saying that that was the way it was. Right. But it ain't that way now. It's right. different. It's That's different. Right. Right. It's vastly well, right. different. Right. And, well, and, I, I tell you, I, I think I did it wrong because, you know, I think I'm the last generation to graduate college and then go right from college into seminary. Uh, but having served as a fire commissioner for the city of New Haven, um, I re- and also serving on the pension board for the city of New Haven, for the police and fire department. I realized that I could have became a firefighter at the age of 18, put 20 years in, be fully vested, and then retire with a full pension, making about $65,000, $70,000 for life. And to be honest with you, my fire chief still recruits me. Um, 37, 36, he said, hey, it's not too late for you to join. And given where we are, where we increase the minimum age for us to come inside ministry, which is around 60, and now Eva talks about increasing the retirement age of 75, it lets me know that I could have put in 40 good years somewhere else then come inside this church. So right now, given our current climate, for, for pastors not to have guaranteed health insurance, for pastors having to raise their own salary for pastors not really having a future once they retire, who in their right mind will come inside this particular profession? That's my son. If if, if my son were to tell me that he wanted to um, actually become a a fifth generation preacher, I would tell him, that's good. I love it. But here's what we're going to do. You're going to get a job first, put 20 years in, get a pension, and then we'll bring you in. Because clearly, you got to be by by vocation now because there's no guarantees in this church. Hey, Stephen, yeah. Stephen let, me, let, me, let, me, let me tell you this, Stephen. You 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 made a, a, a very strong point. Do you know what, what the the limit, the cutoff point was for getting into the itinerary when I came in? It was 39. Yeah. Wow. If, if, if you were over 39, you could not become an itinerant. Now, add 20 years on to that. What do you have, Stephen? 59. 59. And, and, what, and what, is now, what is now the limit? 60. 60. Because, because of what was happening, we were not attracting. We were not attracting people who were coming straight out of college. So they kept lifting the age where you could come into the itineracy. It was 39 when I came wow. here. If you were over 39, you could not go into the itineracy. Wow. You had, you, had, you had to go into the lay work. So that's why we had a number of folk going in and getting started and doing that. So <laughs> they would come in, and as a result, they would come in that time, and they would become bivocational because they had met the requirements of becoming an itinerant at the, before 39. But now it's been smoothed out. There's some people who want to move the age limit almost up to 65. To 70. But, and, and, 70? And, 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 wow. and, that's because, and that's because we recognize the fact that we are, we are rapidly becoming bivocational. We're rapidly becoming to the point where we cannot say to persons who come in and take a church like I had, or for a lot of you, for your first church, and say, make something out of it. How are you going to make something out of it when ain't nothing there to make? How you, how you, how, how you oh, going to make I know something? how. I know how, how Dad. You, I, know how, I heard somebody you know, say, let me heard just somebody say, say this. there's more in the man than in the land. Let me just yes, say sir. this, that uh, I heard it once from a bishop <laughs> who advocated moving the age up from 50 to 60 because he had persons in his church who were bivocational coming into ministry. They were going to seminary they were doing all the educational things and wanted to and, and was really interested in ministry. However, they had passed that 50 year mark. Um, they were qualified. They went to seminary. I'm not. It, it was here. You know, it's an East Coast thing that happened. Philip, I think you're pretty much well aware of it, uh, where that where that mindset really pushed 
the argument of moving the needle from 50 to 60, because you had persons that stated they had gifts and graces, but they just did not meet the age of 50. And believe it or not, you do have proposals that are submitted that ask for the age limit to go from 70. I've actually seen some asking for the age limit to be 75, which is the age of retirement for us. So you know, uh, I, I, the needle continues to move. I tell you, Mike, to, 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 underscore, to underscore your point, Mike, I can remember being on an annual conference floor and hearing people come in uh, as, as they were trying to be admitted into the conference and the bishop at that time, uh, who shall remain nameless, because it was actually a couple of them I served under. Uh, when, as the people would say, you know, when the bishop would ask, well, why'd you wait so long to come in? Well, I've been running from the Lord a long time. I heard a couple of bishops say, well, you've been running this long, you've almost successfully run the race. So you know, in terms of running away from your ministry. So you should, should, should have just kept on trotting. But, uh, yeah. but, no, but, we, we, but that is what we do. It, in, and it happens in failing institutions. In failing institutions, you keep moving the goalposts, lowering the bar. And, and, and that's what is what's happening in this country. Joe Biden will be one of the greatest presidents in the history of this nation because Donald Trump put the bar all the way on the ground. You, know, you, you don't have to do much to get ahead of nothing at all. And he was nothing at all. Well, like, well in the church, what we do is we, we, we just keep, we just keep lowering the goalposts. Okay, so now uh, increase the retire, increase the, the, the age of entry until you arrive at the, at the ridiculous position, the absurd position of having the age of entry <laughs> lining up with the age of retirement. That, 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 that's ludicrous. But now here's the but now but now but now here's the thing. Now, now here's the thing. I believe, I friend believe that the age of retirement will be increased to 80. I can see that based upon our current situation. But will the bishop's retirement age also increase? Now, I've, I've heard that, but now, now there's a question that just came through. And it speaks about in terms of our point of reformation or uh, demonstration. Um, if we talk about African Methodist Episcopal with the schism that we have, should we change the name from just drop the African and just go with Methodist Episcopal, which was a church, Methodist Episcopal church, but should we address it? I know there have been those who've addressed it and said that maybe we should call it American Methodist Episcopal because it seems now that we are being accused of ecclesiastical colonialism, uh, that we that there are those who want to have their own determination, but are not allowed to do so uh, for the uh, lack of representation as a race leadership within our denomination. Should that be addressed to changing that that, that term African? Well, the you know, CME Church. Go ahead, son. Go ahead. I had this conversation a couple of weeks ago with. Um, some of my friends uh, of different races. And when I talk about AME, they always wanted to know what the AME stood for. And when I explained it to them, it was the end of the conversation. They were like, oh, okay, I, I, it makes sense. Uh, when I talk about African, it's really our diaspora. We really talk about how everything originated from Africa. Methodist is where our, our faith system, what we believe in, um, especially our relationship to God. Episcopal is our government where you have, you know, bishops assignment, what have you. Once I explain it like that, they're like, oh, oh, okay, better, good. So from from I think that we have a bad, I think we just have a bad job of just thinking that when we think about African, we automatically think that it's just for black people. But no, it's it's really not. You just have to talk about where we just truly believe that everything originated from Africa, every human being, and that's where life started. So, but I think for us, you just see all blacks. They just think that's just like Africans, it's just predominantly black, black denomination. See, we, we, I'm, I'm gonna say we this. waste, we, go ahead, Joe. I'm, just, I'm sorry, let me say this one thing, I'm sorry. So I'm gonna have to go on mute after this one. And here's part of the problem too. As black people in this country, we have been taught to assimilate with white people. So we will walk into a room filled with white people and we are taught that that's okay because we just got to figure out how to make it. 
but it is very rare that you will see the reverse where you will see someone who's white feel comfortable in a room full of black people. Thus, no matter what the name is, as long as we are a predominantly black denomination, <clears throat> you're only going to have a certain number of white people be, being part of the church simply because of that, what, what I, we can call reverse assimilation factor. Now, wait a minute. Let me, let me just give another spin on this. In terms of our denomination, you have those on the continent that are asking for a sharing of power. And in terms of the whole essence of saying that you use the term African, but there's no sharing of the power of our brothers and sisters on the continent. So there, there, there has been talk um, in some of the um, blogs and some of the pages I'm associated with, one being um, Africa Arise, uh, where they were speaking about this in terms of how can indigenous leadership be embraced as well as respected within a denomination where it seems the power is overseas and not necessarily shared with those on the continent. Well, power is, 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 uh, is, is economically based. I mean, the, 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 over in, over in the, the States, they carry the load, the, the financial load. So that's, you know, that's, uh, that's a different kind of a uh, different kind of animal because I don't know how many times I've had to raise money to bring over the African delegation after I've raised money to bring over the African delegation to bring the African delegation over. I mean, it just goes on and on. I, I, I need to go on mute for real because this, this is making me sick. Well, let me let me say this as you go on mute, Stephen. What <laughs> what 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 has happened? Other denominations have worked to solve that issue. The United Methodist Church went and what they did in in, in thinking and acting in terms of, of, of making like a regional section and you have the United Methodist Church in Africa and you have the United Methodist Church in the United States and they are independent. They elect who they want. They raise money for what they are. They are almost self-supporting and they are a part of the, of the ruling class of the church. If you don't believe it, check what happened when they had that special session of the general conference and the vote that mattered, they kept they keep them from spinning was a vote from the African churches. Now, it's same thing with the Presbyterian church. There are more Presbyterians in Korea than there are almost in the United States. And what, what it is, they elect, they do this and they have a major role. If we would become less colonial and say to the Africans, yes, we want, we want to support, we want you to become independent. We want you to become a part of the AME church, but be yourself re reliant, self-supporting. We will work with you, we will help you, but you must begin to take control of your own destiny as a church. And, and that's, that, that, that's we, we, we need a jurisdiction a jurisdiction called the African jurisdiction of the of the AME Church. So, Dad, what, what would the relationship be, Dad? They be they, they be, they be strong. They they they, act, they come over to a general conference every four years and work with us. All right. So now I see the time on the wall is one ten one oh nine. So we've gone over. Lord have mercy. And now questions are flying in just with the conversations getting ready to, to tell off. Uh, we should thank Sister Gail Kwan for her question about the age of leadership. Uh, while young people do not wish to be a part of uh, the organizations within the church. And for those who've been watching, thank you so much, Sister Patty Poole, Gray, Carol Everett, uh, my son, Mike Jr. Good to see you, son and uh, Richard Lackey and some others. Uh, Cheryl Allen, thank you so much. And Sister Knight over in Morganton. I can't name everybody, uh, but the time is uh, one ten. We got to give our final comments. Uh, I, would, I, I would start off and then we'll go from Steve, Joe, Big Steve, Phil, and then Dad. Um, you know, my comment is we learn to, learn to accept losses as, as we celebrate our wins. The Tar Heels took it to the chin last night at Notre Dame. But one thing I'm learning in a, in a college town, it doesn't affect college students as much as it affects the rest of us. It's just a game. 
And that's how you're able to say there is another game coming up on Saturday. Move on. And so I think for a lot of us, we need to learn to move on and not try to take things so seriously as it relates to that arena. But in this arena, what affects us, yes, learn to take it, but also learn to accept and to embrace that everything may not go your way. Uh, Steve? Eh, good to see everybody. You know, it's winter is coming, as Game of Thrones would say, so I'm prepared for the winter. But love y'all. And till we meet again. Joe? Uh, I want to thank Brother Lavender, Reverend Pace, and of course everybody as always for coming on. And um, it's funny, you know, talking about wins and losses. For those who know me, you know, I love to shoot pool and I have a buddy of mine <laughs> I shoot pool with. And what he always says is, uh, if you miss a shot uh, and it's his turn to shoot, he'll say, now go over there and sit down and think about what you did wrong while you watch me shoot. <laughs> and sometimes... Oh, Lord. That's what you just have to do. If you lose or losing, just go somewhere and sit down and figure out what you did wrong and then try to make some adjustments. Um, I said this to my mom the other day, and this is one thing I'm going to try to do for 2022. Don't make excuses, make adjustments. Thank you, everyone. All right. Big Steve. That's good. Yeah, that's that's good, Dr. Joseph. <laughs> I like that kind of sentiment wherever I can find it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. This this. Uh, discussion. I, I, I was kind of reluctant to uh, come in at first, but now, now I really love it. You know, and, and I believe that the church is at an inflection point. We're going to have to do something. It's going to have to change. And how it changes just, just depends on us. We can make change, but I can't make change by myself. I've already tried to do that. And I'm still trying to find out just what part of the world my head is in because they got cut off and it's rolling down the street somewhere. I don't know where it is. Amen. I'm, I'm, still, I'm, still, I'm still trying to find it. But anyway, if enough of us get together, we can make change. And so yeah. I just love this venue. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. Amen. Thank you, Alan Temple, yes. for, for opening this up. Praise God. Phil? I want to thank uh, Michael for moderating. Yes. I want to thank uh, Joseph for good. this for this format. And the good people of Allen Temple, I think that uh, the, the panelists, and I can speak for myself, enjoy these proceedings. And I only hope that uh, those in the viewing and listening audience can enjoy them as well. I think that uh, for the church, for our church like moving, moving forward, we're gonna have to ask and answer and find an answer to the question, how much of reformation is going to involve deconstruction because we have to do more than, than reform some existing structures. Some of these existing structures can only be deconstructed before reformation, real reformation can take place. All right, so now as you see, as we prepare to hear from Daddy, again, I wish to thank those who purchased the book, uh, the unofficial Rules of the AME way, amen, give you a good lab to understand how to deal with rules as they're made and broken at the same time. It's on Amazon, understanding the rules, uh, the unofficial rules of the AME way. And now to Papa. Daddy, close us out with your comments and then with the prayer. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very uh, joyful that uh, we have this, this format. One thing is certain, you can't solve a problem till you recognize and know and admit that you have a problem. Right. So, so we, 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 are, we, are, we are at the stage where we know we have trouble. We know you can't, you can't solve it till you know you have it and recognize you have it and don't run from it, but try to do something to make sure that it doesn't kill you in the process of, of assuming and consuming all that you are. So I, I think discussion and intelligent discussion and back and forth discussion, discussion doesn't always mean that you're going to agree. Discussion is bring out all of the facts, all of the issues that you have, lay them on the table and present them with all the people around and see where you come out. So I'm grateful that we have this and I thank God for giving us this opportunity through Alan Temple, through Brother Lavender, Reverend Pace, Sister Free, 
Thank you so very much. And pray God will bless us and hope that this day, January the 6th, will never happen anymore in this country and never happen and never become any part of any institution of which we are serving, especially in our ecclesiastical realm. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody.